Thanks a lot, David. Uh, as David said, I, uh, I lead the, the research part in the, in the public sector. Uh, Canada is really very dear to me. Uh, one, one of the things special in the research area is, is, is simply because you know, I, I grew up here in Montreal. Uh, I did my doctorate from McGill. I spent several years in Canada. Uh, later on, I went to, uh, to Germany. I, 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 I studied there uh, at, at DAISY, and then followed by at CERN. It's an international collaboration there. So today, I'll talk about uh, some of the areas uh, which impact scientific computing or research that's related and how technology is enabling it. So let's get started. Uh, I'm really thankful Paul uh, is joining me here. There are a couple of areas, uh, as you can imagine, uh, which uh, scientists tend to use uh, as for, for, for research. And the first thing is the access to, access to the infrastructure in minutes. Uh, second is, is really it enables global collaborations. Uh, I'll give you a couple of examples today uh, related to biomedical uh, field as well as, as, well as the, uh, the part related to CERN. Uh, it's elastic. That means you can uh, automatically expand and shrink it. Uh, it is globally accessible, secure, and scalable. Uh, as, as you know, AWS is, is a global infrastructure, so it is uh, more uh, available in, in, in 20 regions. So if you see that, that particular left side, you will realize that it's uh, uh, in, in the US, in Europe, uh, Canada, as well as various other countries. And you need that for research, right? They're interconnected networks such that you can share your data, you can share your algorithm, and then you can work together with various folks. Uh, we have uh, 20 reasons, 61 availability zones. So those small circles you see, they are the availability zones. So every reason has one or more availability zones. And th there are numerous edge locations in, uh, in terms of compute, for a long time, the tradition of compute is what, we, what people call homogeneity in architectures, right? If you look at supercomputers, there are a huge homogeneous set of computers, and uh, you, you try to schedule a job or run on it. But, but with time, we realized that that process need to be changed, and based on the customer feedback, the way we look at the compute is really in three major areas. One is what we call uh, virtual servers, so, so those are like batch systems where you can schedule jobs, but also you need resource isolations, right? For example, if Paul is running a job in the same CPU, you still have certain resources available, right? Like memories or, or network. Can we schedule them together? If you do that, then you have to define some rules on security, and that's called resource isolation, and that's done via what we call container mechanism. And we have a numerous set of services to do that, container scheduling containers. And the third part is what we call serverless computing. Uh, imagine your boss tells you to get something done today, right? That triggers a, a given mechanism to do some studies, right? So that's a mechanism one can do that using step functions or lambda functions to do serverless computing. So that once the job is done, it shrinks back to the normal scenarios. Even in CPU, I talked about the supercomputers, it started with homogeneity in processing. But even in CPU, you will realize that we, based on customer feedback, people need different sets. For example, there are general purposes, there are compute optimized, there are some are storage optimized. And with the advancement of analytics like machine learning and AI, we started seeing more and more usage of what we call accelerated computing. I'll come back to that. So in, in AWS, we provide almost all sets. Even uh, we provide something called bare metal instances where we can give it to you bare metal uh, based on a given processing system. We all know what CPU is, right? But I just briefly want to mention, CPUs are typically 10 to 100 processing cores, right? They use what we call predefined instruction as a data set path. But imagine you, uh, as uh, there is evolution in accelerated computing, people started using GPUs. And they have roughly about 1,000 processing cores. And they, they, they also use predefined instruction set and the data pathways. And then 
if you want to even go bigger, then people started using FPGAs. They have roughly about a million of programmable digital logics. So the bottom line is, based on what you want to do, you can use a given set. Instead of running a large set on a CPU, you can run either on GPUs or, FP, uh, or FPGAs uh, for accelerated computing. That, that evolution already started coming in, in, in this world. Even in, for example, here are a couple of case studies. For example, if uh, in Amazon uh, P3 instances, we have something up the order of eight uh, NVIDIA Voltas. Uh, they typically people use it for machine learning or HPC or financial services and so on and so forth. We also have something called GPU graphics instance. Uh, that is people use it for 3D rendering. Suppose you want to do a rendering and collaborating with various folks at, uh, across, the, across the different places, you can use that. We also have, uh, as I mentioned, FPGAs, F1 instances. So you'll ask, what shall I do with FPGAs? How can I use for scientific computing? I'll give you a couple of studies very soon on that. So here is one place. I came from, uh, as I said, uh, CERN. CERN is an international collaboration where uh, many countries participate. Uh, this is the Large Hadron Collider at CERN, and this particular uh, picture is one of the detectors. It's called Silicon Detector, and it's me and my colleagues there. Uh, CERN has roughly about more than 6,000 researchers around 40 countries, and it produces approximately 25 petabyte of data. Uh, there are two major experiments there, ATLAS and CMS collaborations, and P, uh, they use all kind of processing ways to study uh, various, uh, various parts of physics. And several countries are involved, as I said. One is Canada, Germany, Spain, and, and, and EU, uh, UK, US, and so on and so forth. The way it is defined is after the data is, uh, after the collision happens at CERN, it happens at 95 nanoseconds. And once, once you have the collisions, uh, we store the data at, at the tier zero and then get distributed to various tier one center. And one of them is Canada and as well as US. So one of the things, uh, if you look at the, the, the detector, this is uh, one of the detectors I worked uh, there for several years. Uh, if, if I can use the laser pointer, this is the size of a human. It has 80 million electronic channels. If you multiply by four bytes at a 40 megahertz data taking rate, you're talking about 10 petabytes of information per second. So how do you analyze 10 petabytes of information per second? So what we did there is to divide into two parts, what we call online processing. People use uh, FPGAs for that so that you can analyze it, that data stream at that rate. Th there you select a given particle kind and then you analyze the rest of the events which, uh, it, at, a, at, a, at a batch level which becomes a little bit lower in, uh, lower in size. So they have roughly about 2,000 scientists from 180 countries, with, uh, 180 institutions uh, uh, from 40 countries. And then comes also at 25 nanoseconds, uh, you can see, imagine this is a collision happening here. Which one is the laws of nature? It's very difficult because there are overlapping events also there, right? So you need advanced techniques like machine learning to really detect the property of nature. So one of the problems faced there for, for, for simulations and modeling is, imagine you have a data taking happening here, right? And imagine you have a set of resources called X number of CPUs, doesn't matter, right? As soon as you want to process this particular peak, you, know, you cannot go beyond this line, so you process it by delays in timing. So elasticity started becoming important. So what we try to do is, work with uh, Fermilabs, it's one of the tier one center, like, uh, like a Canadian tech tier one center, we change the schedule in the behind, such that when the simulation jobs comes in, it automatically expands to Amazon and shrinks back when you don't need it. So look at it, with that simple, so the environment remains the same, the processing remains the same, with that pattern, we created roughly about 60,000 slots using AWS spot instances. Spot instances are uh, unused capacity in, in a given areas. Uh, one can use it using, at, a, at a price you requ request. So this way you created factor of five Fermilab. Imagine if you are to buy factor of five Fermilab, how long will it take? And then you shrink it back. 
So what is, not Im what is important is, is that, yes, it, 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 it went up to 60,000 CPUs, but even more interesting is ups and downs, right? That means when there is no job in the scheduler, the instance terminates. You don't pay for that. And when there is more job in the scheduler, it automatically expands. And that's, and that's what we need, one needs in, in, in computing, that it automatically, elastically expands or shrinks based on the requests. And this is do, all done in a, in a, in a uh, using unused capacity. We run for a few weeks there. Details are there in this particular, particular article. Uh, you, so it's not only the formula I can do that. Anyone can do that. We made those software public for free. Uh, it's HD Condor mechanism. This is the way to do it. This is the link here. Uh, there are some tutorials. You can do it yourself as well. Uh, the, sa the same thing we tried to expand using what we call uh, machine learning. So we were trying to study what we call topic model modeling with Clemson researchers. There is the same kind of situations where they, they had a given set of resources in their campus, but for machine learning, uh, they wanted to expand using, using Amazon. So the, so the entire environment remains the same the way it was in the Clemson University. This automatically expanded to roughly about 1.1 uh, million cores. Imagine somebody planned to buy 1.1 million cores. So this was extremely cost effective, and it was all used using spot instances. Uh, uh, we also uh, had our partner helped us in, in, in this process. Uh, they are uh, the cloudy cluster. The, so one can use, still use those, those processes even today by any of you. Uh, so use cloudy cluster, which has a bad system built in, uh, which is Slurm, which auto expands to AWS, keeping exactly your environment the way it is. And it will shrink it back when, when, when it's not needed. So it's not only about uh, you know, how big can we go, but it's also what, what, what else can we do given the advancement in the processing. So here is another study I'd like to show you. Uh, as you know, to, to sequence genomes, it takes months to years with a large set of computing, right? So imagine you're running thousands of CPUs running for the whole year. So instead of doing that, one of the ways these folks did at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia with Edco Genome is they started using those FPGAs, which, I, I, as I mentioned, has roughly about a million processing units, right? They analyzed about 1,000 human genomes in two and a half hours using FPGAs or Amazon F1 instance. So they not only pay a few dollars to Amazon, but also got... Uh, the Guinness Book of World Record for fastest analysis in the, in the world. So within two and a half hours, you, you can do uh, uh, genomic sequencing uh, using uh, the kind of processor you're, you're, you're using. So they use Amazon F1 instances, and, and they complete it in uh, two hours, 25 minutes, or something like that. So the bottom line is, based on the kind of study, you don't have to use all the time the CPUs or GPUs, a given resource would be super useful for, for the given kind of workload. We also worked with Hubble Telescope. Uh, so we, we, we provided uh, almost 28 years of the Hubble Telescope data in cloud for anyone to analyze it. Uh, we also worked with uh, neutrinos. Uh, this is an experiment at, uh, at, at, at NOVA. It's, it's international. Many, many uh, uh, folks from all over the world use it. So why I'm talking about neutrinos? Do you know neutrinos? Okay, neutrinos are the particles that pass all over our body, right? So what's so special about neutrinos? One of the things we learned about neutrinos is they change identity. So imagine you shoot a John at a given place. It passes through the Earth's rock, and you detect a second one. And you are detecting a Lisa. So changing identity it becoming a part of nature is really crucial. So this is one of the studies they did that where a given particle changed the identity some, some of the time. So here they used uh, AWS uh, to do the processing, but also various the analytics part. So there you need machine learning or, and, and, and other analytics to detect it. So coming back to machine learning, 
We look at machine learning in, in various ways. So we, we start with what we call AWS services, where there is a preload dynamics are there, for example, related to uh, 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 AW, uh, what we call uh, 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 recognition or poly or comprehend based on voice. Uh, Alexa uses Lex, for example. Uh, we also uh, provide services associated with how you can use it in a given framework, for example, Amazon SageMaker, how you can label it automatically using ground truth. But also we give the freedom of infrastructure such that people can use their own algorithm. You can use TensorFlow, if you like TensorFlow, if you like MXNet. So based on what users like, they use the a given kind of algorithm. So this is, this is a fantastic framework most of our researchers use. Within machine learning, as you know, there are categorized into like supervised, unsupervised, and reinforcement learning. We provide all those algorithms built into the infrastructure. So in this particular example, like as you can see, you, all you need to do is start with a given notebook uh, for your research and then start using the algorithms like k-min clustering, or principal component analysis, or neural net. But also you can use deep learning if exactly the same way. It's it's very simple step, three ways. You just start building uh, your framework using a simple Python-based notebook. Then you train it using a couple of, uh, couple of clicks. Uh, you define your loss function and get your happy parameter. Uh, so here is one of the studies people did in, in Stanford. Uh, so this is in the field of convolution neural net. Uh, in, in convolution neural net, uh, you have a set of input layer and the hidden layer as well as the output. So in this particular study, as you know, many people get diabetics, right? So what it happens? It affects your nerve vessels. You go to the doctor, and the doctor says, you know, it affected your eyes. But sometimes you can train those images on a standard eyes, call it background-only hypothesis, any deviation in those nerve vessels, you can detect it. And thus people started doing it uh, using AWS. So you can do it today in your studies. You can also, uh, for example, this is one of the study we did with, uh, in collaboration with National Science Foundation as well as other, other folks, where you can train based on the social information you have and start predicting the path of a given, a given hurricane. In this particular example, uh, uh, this left one is the predicted path, and this is the real path. Imagine you can predict hurricane 20 or 30 minutes before it is giving a, a given area. That will help hugely the, the disaster response team, right? So we plan to use some of this, make it public, give it to Red Cross or something like that to try a pilot out. So this is one of the studies we did in research areas. You can also use... Uh, uh, automatic detection of damages. For example, if you look at the top layer, it's very hard to know which damage was the most, right? Uh, but if you have a given me mechanism, uh, you can detect it. For example, this has a DAV of uh, 0 0.423, but this one corresponds to the highest damage. So you can uh, train the model, put them in, in a camera or a drone, and can auto-detect given damages. The details of the study is there in this particular archive. We also collaborated in, in something called Thousand Genome, Genome Project. It started roughly in 2008, uh, where many collaborators, including Canada, was there. Uh, uh, we started this collaboration with National Institute of Health, but in collaboration with so many folks. And uh, we hosted this data. Even today, that data is available for anyone to analyze. A thousand people donated it uh, in order to study uh, genomics for different, different kind, different race, and, 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 and uh, kind of characters. Australia, for example, uh, successfully studied uh, mapping the Coela uh, genomes. Uh, it's a really interesting study. Uh, it was in CNN uh, and various other news ma media. Uh, this particular species is very picky on what they eat. Uh, they, they sometimes chew on the calyptips leaves, and uh, that can be poisonous to, to many, of, many, of the, many of the other species. So uh, this particular study maps out uh, uh, various areas uh, of how to help uh, this particular species. Uh, it's, it's a fantastic study. It came out in, in, research, uh, in Nature. Uh, please have a look at details here. Uh, that, was, uh, that used AWS CFN cluster uh, to, uh, to, to, to analyze uh, the, the, the genome 
um, using using various uh, various uh, processing units I mentioned before. Uh, NHS is also building what we call data lakes or data services in in UK, and uh, they they are working with us uh, to to record and store in our platform. With that, uh, I'll I'll give back to Paul. Uh, then we will come back and and ask for questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sanjay. Good morning, everybody. Um, I'd, this morning, I'd like to tell you a story uh, which we call democratization of high-performance computing. Democratization meaning available to everybody in this context. And I'll come back to that point later. So the, um, this work came out of a collaboration. Oh, my clicker isn't working. Big green button. Ah, there we go. Uh, between the uh, Communications Research Center and the National Microbiology Laboratory. The CRC is the government's center of excellence on wireless research. Um, as you know, the world is increasingly powered by wireless devices, whether it's cell phones, GPS, emergency service dispatch, uh, air traffic control radar, all these things require radio frequencies to operate. And we're now looking at new services like 5G, Internet of Things coming along. They all require frequencies to operate, what we call wireless spectrum, but spectrum is a finite resource. How do we make sure that all these things work reliably in Canada? How do we make sure they work better in Canada than anywhere else in the world? And that is the job of the regulator. We provide the scientific advice to the regulator, which is our parent organization. The uh, NML is part of PHAC, a public health agency. They have a, the highest uh, containment level uh, microbial containment facility, level four, uh, in Canada. Uh, they keep all the nasties like Ebola there. Um, NML has dual role. They are involved in scientific research, looking at uh, techniques for treating and dealing with disease. They invented the uh, vaccine for Ebola, in fact, so right here in Canada, actually done in Winnipeg. They also have an outbreak detection and response capability, where they're looking to find out what the, these uh, outbreaks which we hear about, uh, infectious disease outbreaks, like when you hear about an uh, E. coli breakout, they use genomic sequencing to figure out what the specific strains of E. coli, for example, uh, are, and correlate that to try and figure out Where's the size of the outbreak? Where's the origin of the outbreak? And then coordinate a response to that. And any type of outbreak response, they will be the guys uh, involved doing it. And they have developed a number of world-class uh, techniques and software applications to help that, which are, which are used internationally. Now, it may seem at first blush that we're a very odd bedfellows to be collaborating. Why, why would the, the wireless guys want to collaborate with the genomic guys? Well, it turns out that in my discussions with a number of science departments and agencies, we all have a common set of problems. Modern science requires ever-increasing amounts of compute. We all need to ingest data, store data, process data, visualize data, apply machine learning, AI. We want to collaborate with each other. And those who are constrained on on-premises hardware just cannot do that. Uh, and there's no easy way, particularly in a government context, to scale that dramatically. Cloud is a good solution. The CRC has been in cloud for more, uh, nearly four years. We have built in that time a secure scientific computing environment, which we're going to boast and say is the most advanced in Canada, in the government of Canada, certainly. The uh, NML has an on-prem data center. They have expertise in high-performance compute. But they are finding, during outbreak detections, that they are running out of CPU. So the question was, could they use cloud to burst out of their data center in times of significant activity to improve the time to uh, uh, outbreak detection response? And the other question was, could you do it cost effectively? And then from what we learned from that, could we use those techniques to, I say, real science? Real science being the discovery science, which is part of NML's mandate and the CRC's mandate, as well as the operational science that they're using. So those are our three questions. So to answer that, we created a six-week challenge. And the idea of six weeks is cloud enables you to move fast, learn fast, fail fast. 
What can we do in six weeks? And it's a common technique we use at the, uh, the CRC to try and move the yardstick on what's, what's possible and what works. So can we take the outbreak part of their uh, NML's HPC infrastructure, migrate it into our virtual research domain, our, our scientific cloud infrastructure, on Amazon Web Services, build this proof of concept, and then do some benchmarking with real-world use cases from, uh, from uh, sample data from uh, situations of, uh, of actual public health significance. So we took a three-phase approach. First one, very, very simple, lift and shift. Don't think too hard. Just get it going. Take a week or two. Then we're going to optimize, or really in the time we had available, let's just call it cloudifying. And then the last, we would do a, uh, a measurement, do a benchmarking. How does it compare with on-prem? So we put together a very small, very focused uh, interdisciplinary team from the CRC and the NML, of, uh, as you can see, very different uh, uh, backgrounds, supported loosely by a conglomeration of other, other folks. And we used a very agile approach with weekly sprints to see how we were progressing. So phase one, lift and shift. What we were trying to lift and shift w was this, and essentially, uh, in the, the bottom, you see the Slurm controller, which is the, an HPC uh, orchestrator, and Galaxy and Arida, some uh, software that has been developed by the NML and is widely used in genomic sequencing worldwide. They have a, a data store uh, and on-prem, and they have a database, and then in their uh, data center, they have all these virtual machines which they can use for, to, to burst out into their uh, for, for various uh, analysis uh, as well as response analysis. And they're limited to about 7,000 uh, CPU cores and about 40 terabytes of RAM. So the lift and shift approach was to simply take that architecture, move it into AWS, and just use like for like. So from the data store, we put it into what's called EFS storage. From the Galaxy database, we put it into RDS. Uh, just, and everything else was just VMs. And the cluster at the top there, we put into an AWS auto-scaling group, because auto-scaling will give us infinite resources. So we did that. Good news was, it didn't take a week or two, it took three days, and we had it working. So we were, that was very, very satisfying. However, it didn't work very well. So the simple dumb approach didn't work. I'll show you some numbers to justify what I mean. So then we started to immediately get into the cloudifying, the optimization. And we had two major problems that we discovered when we did our lift and shift that we needed to address. One is scaling. We couldn't scale big enough. So, and then just to explain what that means, this is the error we were getting. Insufficient instance capacity within the availability zone. And I'll briefly explain, uh, Sanjay mentioned uh, regions and availability zone, but within a, an AWS region, for example, uh, Canada Central Montreal, or, or uh, US East, which is North Virginia, you will have a number of availability zones. To us, an availability zone is a data center. In reality, it's one or more data centers. And in each region, you have, in fact, multiple data centers. The way we had architected it was simple lift and shift. You couldn't burst across multiple data centers. So we fixed that. So we fixed the, the size of scaling problem. The other scaling problem we had is we couldn't scale fast enough. So in a high performance compute world, what you'd really like to do is what the blue graph here is showing. At the beginning of your job, you scale to the full number of resources you know you're gonna need for that job, you run them flat out during your, your job, and then you turn them off at the end and, and reduce your cost to zero. But if you just do the basic default, use the AWS auto scaling algorithm, it's not designed for high performance compute. So it was really the wrong tool to be using, and we got this. Clearly very inefficient, our jobs were taking far longer than they needed to. So, we, uh, we very, so from our perspective, very inefficient. So what we did, we built our own out of that Slurm controller, that Slurm orchestrator that I mentioned. It took us about a week, and it's obviously not perfect. Given more time, I'm sure we could improve. But with that, we got far better scaling, far better efficiency, and then, and then the, the things started to run much more quickly. So that was one problem we were solving, the, or the scaling problem. The second problem we were having is pumping enough data quickly enough through our compute cluster. So we analyzed four different types of data storage. I won't go into too much detail. We started on, on the left, which is clearly the wrong choice. Lift and shift, again, don't think too hard, just get it going. And we tried a few others. 
There was one of great interest to us. At the time, it was a new feature from AWS, the FSx Luster, designed for high-performance compute. And it seemed on the paper that it would actually meet a lot of our needs. And we started, started to use it very, very heavily. And in fact, we got a call from the, the AWS guys. What are you doing with our luster? You're essentially breaking it. And the AWS development team worked together with us to improve it. And it was, it was a, very a very good collaboration. It turned out for our application, it still wasn't ideal. And we ended up using the uh, S3 API. I won't go into details, but it turns out to be a, a cost-effective and high-performance storage uh, solution for a multi-availability zone application like we were using. So, okay, so we solved scaling. We've solved uh, the big problems with data. So what does that look like? Essentially, it looks very, very similar to what we started with. At the bottom, you see our VPN firewall. Again, this is a a secure environment, and in fact, we built this, I, actually it's worth saying, we built this in a secure enclave that for collaborators. The way we've architected our virtual research domain, we can create an enclave for each collaborator. They can work securely and privately in that. They don't even see the data uh, or the work of any other collaborator or the CRC unless we choose to share. So they had their own environment. They could securely access it via a VPN from Winnipeg, even though we were not running in Winnipeg, obviously. Um, we had the same controllers. The Slurm controller now took control over the scaling as opposed to relying upon uh, the AWS auto scaling. We changed the storage type from EFS for data storage to S3. Um, and then we had the, the, uh, the ability to scale our cluster across multiple uh, availability zones. So that was the final architecture. And now we're about four to five weeks in. So what does that mean? How well did it actually work? Let's do some, some benchmarking. So to do our benchmarking, we used two real use cases. So from 2017, there was this E. coli outbreak. And what that meant, there was, uh, in fact, it was across six provinces. They were trying to analyze the genomes to figure out where, what kind of E. coli, what would be our response to it, where was the source, and, and deal with it appropriately. And this is the kind of thing they have to do routinely uh, at any given point. This is all going on in the background. We don't get to see or worry about it, so the, the guys are taking care of it for us. Um, the other thing they were doing is uh, anti looking for antimicrobial resistant gene detection. So I think, as we all know, the, the, uh, the uh, antibiotic resistance is a major problem these days. And what they were asked to do was to look through their entire database of genomic sequences that they had and say, have we seen this in Canada? That was a much larger use case. Not something that they do very frequently, but obviously a very important uh, activity when it comes up. And it's worth saying at this point that all the data we were using is publicly available, and in fact was uh, not, uh, unlike the example that Sanjay mentioned about a human genome, this is not human genome, this is E. coli genomes, things like that. So there was no privacy or ethical concerns about using this data. So we, we uh, pulled these, uh, these data sets into our cloud. And what we did, we created two benchmarks. So the 10,000 genomic sequences uh, came to about 10 terabytes. That was more on the E. coli. And then the 100,000 sample simulation was the, the uh, uh, antimicrobial resistance. About 100 terabytes of data there. And we ran each of these benchmarks on the on-premises system we did the cloud lift and shift, only the 10,000, because we knew it was, it was poor, it wouldn't be worth doing 100,000, and then our cloud optimized. And it looked a bit like this. So with the optimized version of the cloud, we were approximately four times faster than on-prem and for, for the 10,000 samples, and for the 100,000 samples, it was about seven times faster. Um, it's worth saying that in this particular case, this is outbreak detection, so simply scaling up means now we have the capability to respond more quickly to, to outbreak detection. So we, we, we solved the problem with, with scaling. You can see cloud lift and shift. I'm not even going to mention it. It's, it was just bad. Now, we can't talk about scaling into the cloud without talking about cost. Um, to understand this slide, uh, there's two, two elements to it. There's the base cost and the burst cost. The base cost is all the elements which have to be running all the time to be ready to run a, a workload. So obviously storage is a key one. We, the benchmark here is 100 terabytes of storage online. We had the base CPU for the Slurm control, the Arida and Galaxy software. So uh, initially, lift and shift, $1,000 a day. With Optimize, we, we got it down to $130 a day. 
The burst cost is when you actually want to run one of these workloads. So for a 10,000 sample genomic SQL sample, 62 bucks or 100,000, 220 bucks. So these are great numbers, but what does that mean? Um, well, let's say that you ran this, this so-called optimized data center running 10,000 samples every day, 365 days a year. A data center doing that workload would be something of the order of $70,000. Now, if anybody has an experience with how much it costs to run on-premises data centers, you'll realize that's, that's just nothing. It's, it's a drop in the ocean. So certainly from the perspective of would this be a useful technique and a cost-effective technique to, to burst out from your data center, we think yes. So, um, conclusions. We have, we think, successfully demonstrated that the elements of the, the uh, National Microbiology Laboratory's HPC system, the, the elements related to outbreak detection, can be successfully migrated into the cloud, and we think optimized for cloud uses. And we also think we've demonstrated cost effectiveness. Now, the last point, cloud HPC can be used for real science. And what I mean by that is we were looking to find techniques that aren't just useful for operational science. Can it be used for other types of science too? And I know this is true because before we'd even finished our uh, work with, with uh, NML, researchers at the CRC became aware of what we were doing. And they came to us and said, hey guys, uh, we see you're doing this high performance compute. I have a problem. I'm trying to do analysis across Canada. And it's taking so long, I'm uh, having to restrict myself to one province can I use what you're doing? And we said, sure, of course you can. So we gave it to them and helped them get going. And now they're running across Canada, full analyses for this wireless uh, spectrum for in, in just hours, uh, whereas they couldn't do it for, for days before. So it does immediately scale and apply to other science. So what are our takeaways from this? So I'm gonna say that HPSC is available to all in the cloud. I'm gonna take that back to the original title, Democratization of HPC. When I say it's available to all, if you have a cloud account, the code to do this is now in GC code. You can download it, you can use it, you can, you can run it. We didn't use any fancy additional services. It's, it's just available what you can do. And when you think about it, making it available to all changes the paradigm of how we do science in Canada. We have had, in the past, limited resources. And yet we're dealing with global problems like all the other science uh, outfits around the world. Up to now, what we've had to do is to scale our problem down to the size of the resources we had available to address those problems. Now with cloud, we can scale our resources up to the size of the problem. So Canadian science has now had the potential to be even more relevant than it ever has been in the past. We can compete with any other nation because now we have the compute resources. Um, We've shown that cloud is scalable uh, on demand and, and we think cost effective. We've also shown that collaborations can, are quite, can be very valuable, even between apparently very different science organizations because we have actually a common set of interests. And we found that early wins are possible. If you embrace cloud and the pace that cloud actually enables you to, uh, to, to move at, you can, if you have the boldness just to go ahead and do it, you can learn a lot and uh, early wins are indeed possible. So, thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Paul. Um, it's all about democratizing uh, research. So with that, and research is all about everything, right? Uh, Paul talked about genomics, HPC, I talked about machine learning, AI. I really like to open it to the audience and I'd love to get your questions. Anyone from the audience? Excellent, yes, please. Oh, there's a microphone coming to, so that you can be heard. So it's actually a very small question. Um, the size of your team for the six weeks, um, I guess proof of concept, how big was your team? So the people focusing for the six weeks was a team of three. They were supported by a larger team of a couple more at the CRC and a few more at the NML. And bear in mind that they were working with an existing HPC system that existed at NML, an existing virtual research domain at the CRC. So they weren't starting from scratch. 
And did they have help from AWS experts or suppliers experts? Like, how did they figure it out how to use the cloud in such a very small amount of time? Uh, well, we've been in the cloud for four years, so we knew how to use the cloud. And that was what we brought to the collaboration. We knew cloud, NML knew HPC. Together, we could learn from each other. And I will say, though, actually, the AWS uh, High Performance Compute guys did consult with us to give us some guidance. Just to add to that, uh, we, we do have uh, what we call immersion days, uh, where we, we, we provide, uh, we bring our solution architect and others, and we, we provide uh, some uh, trainings to how to get on board and how to use it and, and, and so on and so forth. So if, you, if you're interested, please feel free to reach to your, your local, uh, local account manager or local contact. And we'll, we'll arrange it one day of training uh, uh, as immersion days uh, from, from at least the research side, or, or, uh, and, and it's for free, yes. You just have to ask. Exactly. Hi. Uh, I think you said uh, with the NML, they had uh, on-premise of 7,000 these CPUs. So when you went to the cloud, how many did you actually scale up to to get that performance increase? Was it a lot more? Uh, actually, what happened, uh, it's a very good question, how did we scale? So 7,000 CPU is their physical limit. The, uh, because we were benchmarking, and it wasn't a real outbreak, we were having to share C uh, the, the data center with the other researchers. So in practice, they were bursting out to 2,000 cores for, uh, for the benchmarks. We were able to uh, burst up to 8,500 in our uh, simulations. Next question. Hi. Um, could you elaborate on the background work that was done prior to getting NML on board? For example, you know, I couldn't go on with my credit card, go and decide, and okay, I'll go on Amazon and I'm going to do burst at 7,000 vCPUs. So what kind of framework does the CRC have in order to accommodate uh, that kind of workload? So that is a very uh, long answer to that question. We do, we, and I'll be very happy to talk with you afterwards, and some of my guys are here today, give you much more technical answers. We have built a full environment. All the scientific computing from the CRC has been in the cloud now for three years. So we've got a lot of experience on how to do scientific computing in the cloud. And we have a full, secure infrastructure to do that. Maybe just a brief comment for Government of Canada people in the room uh, who, that you might be with the Government of Canada. Um, CRC has their own situation at this point, but any department in, in the government is able to work with the major cloud providers through contracts issued by um, Shared Services Canada and start small and work up to where Paul is at. So that's available to you. If, if you wish to take advantage of it, you do not need to use your credit card, sir. <laughs> Perhaps one more question and we need to wrap up. Okay, let's wrap up. Thank you so much, Paul and Sanjay. It was fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.